I'll see if I can send her an invite. Sorry, everyone. So, Jack, do you want to ask me a question whilst I'm going to do this? And I'll see if yeah. I can see if I can invite people. Okay, shall I check? Shall I check your multitasking? Yeah. So yeah, Matt, like, how do you think this will affect Middle Eastern kind of um, peace at the moment? I think this is what it's been waiting for the whole time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, me absolutely <laughs> terrified about the tech, which I've been terrified about all day. Uh, let me see if I can copy me. I think tech, tech stress is the worst. Like one of my one of my worst nightmares is projectors. I'm just like projectors work or they don't work, but if they're not working, there's absolutely no clear reason as to why they're not working. No, terrifying, isn't it? Right, so ask me a question about the label, and I'll see if I can answer. All that. right, Matt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, well, well, first of all, I guess about you, like, what, like, can you can you discern a point that you started, like, writing words became like a key part of, of being you. When words became a, p a key part of me. Yeah, was was there like a key moment? Can you look back on like for me? I, you know, I had like little writing compositions at school and did plays, but have you got a moment when you were like, yeah, I think kind of like poetry is a thing? Yeah, basically I was 17 and at sixth form and the West Yorkshire music scene, as I'm sure you're aware of, was absolutely buzzing at the time. Um, and all my mates at sixth form were in bands and stuff. And I really, really wanted to be in a band, but you know, writing a song requires you to be able to read and write music, have an instrument, be able to sing, etc. And so it wasn't really, um, it wasn't really available to me. But then I started I started becoming obsessed with this band called Reverend of the Makers. Can you remember him? Yeah, of course, yeah. yeah. Heavyweight champion of the world. Didn't, know, but, didn't have a track called Skin Demoralised? He had a track that, ref, that had the phrase Skin and Demoralised in it. Yeah. Um, all right, Louise. Oh, wow, you look amazing. Yeah, I love, how, I love how much more glamorous Louise looks than us. I know. I mean, I put, well, I'll do my top button up, see if that helps. Um, so yeah, this guy John have McClure from the Makers, he used to Louise, do. Have you got a light installation there? See if I can unmute her. Yeah, she has. I know that's incredible, isn't it? Um, this is like Louise, some kind of three stages. There's Matt. There's you. That you look. You look. It, I don't know. It looks like we need to save you from whatever's going on. There's me kind of out in the garden. It's like yeah, look, that's fine. And then Louise is like in heaven or something. What's uh, going on there? Loving this. Um, I know she looks incredible. She always does, though. She always puts on a show with Louise. Um, okay, so yeah. so you so you got into Reverend the Makers. Yeah, and the guy John McClure used to do short verses of spoken word in between songs, like 20, 30 second long poems. And some sometimes he'd do song lyrics as a poem, whatever. And so the way that he crossed over really fascinated me. And then they did a track with John Cuba Clark, so I discovered who he, who he was. Found out that Alex Turner was really into him. And um, and so at the age of seventeen, I thought, well, I can't. I can't learn how to write music overnight. I ain't got an instrument, but I can feasibly write a poem. Not that it's easy, but it's something you can do straight away without any prior training. So I wrote a poem in the, um, in the library at sixth form, started getting on stage, introducing mates' bands as a compare, but then doing poems. I wouldn't say to the promoter, can I get up and do a few poems before this band? I'd just say, look, my mates want me to introduce them, and then I'd just do a poem anyway, and it just sort of built from there, really. And the fact that it was so accessible, the fact that I could do it so quickly, like I say, I'm not, not saying it's easy, but as a 17-year-old, it was extremely impatient. I loved it. Uh, your video's just gone. Oh, no, it's come back now. So, yeah, that's how I got into it. And then um, after about nine months, I've been putting poetry on MySpace, and the guy contacted me and said, do you want to set that to music? And I was like, all right, yeah, sure. And we did that, and then ended up signing a massive record deal, and I was a singer in a band for a bit. And then that inevitably went to shit, so I turned back to poetry. <laughs> so do you, do you think there's something, I mean, your description there of kind of just, you know, being really easily, it's something easy to get into. I think some people sometimes have a similar thing about like the guitar is such a cheap instrument compared to like lots of other things, you know, to buy a sax or a trumpet is harder than to buy an acoustic guitar. But yeah. but just to, just to say words is kind of, so do you think there's something very accessible about poetry and spoken word? It's the most accessible art form in a way, because even if you like people say, oh, well, what about painting? But it's like, you've still got to buy canvas and paintbrush and paint. Obviously you can draw, like you can get a pencil and you can scribble, you can do a sketch. But I feel like, <sighs> I need to be careful what I say here. It's very, very difficult to do. You don't, I don't think you do. This is your, this is your moment. Okay. Go it's for very, it. Very, 
it's very very difficult to start drawing and be and be good almost straight away you can sort of fluke being good at poetry straight away now obviously a lot of my early poetry was shite but like if you've still got a way with words and you've got ideas you know the, the, you can be passable at a much earlier stage. i mean i guess in some sense i guess in some sense the art of turning um an experience of the world into language is something that even if you do it 16 17 you've you've had some relationship with yourself and language for a long time right so yeah. you've, you're from whatever two or three you've been turning your experience of the world into language which is kind of different to drawing because you've not been just accidentally drawing and then you just start doing it as an art form yeah exactly exactly or like computer skills like computer skills yeah yeah it's just not something that you just pick up overnight is it whereas like you say if you've, if you've already articulated ideas and stuff then maybe when you start writing a poem that just naturally spills into the poem if that makes sense yeah sure sure um, can i just ask you both um maria have you got it on facebook yeah um yeah you've got it on louise aren't you because tori is saying Did you guys join on your phone? Because Toria and Selena are saying they need the meeting ID. Sorry, I know this is boring for everyone. I, I've joined on my phone and didn't need the meeting ID. I just clicked on the link and it took me through. I'm Matt, just going to ask. Give me a sec. Um, you want us all on the same screen? Because if not, while I'm performing, you can like, get off and then let them in. I don't, oh, hold on. Oh, Selena's managed it now. Selena's managed it now. So it's just Toria that seems to be having problems. Um, Sorry about all this boring tech chat, everyone. We're going to... Right, Selena. It might there might be a thing that says join with computer audio. Oh no, you can to audio now. I'll ask Selena how she managed it, then I can tell Toria. Um, you so, I know she looks amazing, doesn't she? Hello, hello, hello. Um, can I just ask you a boring question, Selena? Sorry, you know it wasn't working, and you needed the ID. What made it work for you? I can't hear anything yet. Oh. Do I need to? <laughs> oh, tech. This is why Sonic used to record them and then tell people it's live, just to shatter the showbiz illusion. This is why. Still don't have any audio. That's weird. Right. Okay. Hello. <laughs> Hello, Selena. Can you hear me now? No, you can't. All right. Let's let's chat about poetry for another. Maybe one more question, Jack, and then I'll we'll go to Louise and Louise. Me, I can hear you. I can hear you. Oh, can you hear me? Right. Hi. Sorry, everyone. Um, so, Selena, how come you managed to join the second time? You know, you're having problems at first because Toria still can't join. Uh, the second email worked. Right. Yeah, the second email worked. You look gorgeous. Matt's Louise. just texting Tori now to tell her. <laughs> it's like a big, it's like a pub crawl. No, We're no, in the bar in the back. Actually, I need a drink. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. Um, all right, cool. So, Jack, do you want to ask us one more question and then we'll get... Uh, yes, yeah, so, so I guess, yeah, I, I mean, I guess I remember... What, what must be four and a half years now because yeah, i think you've been doing it a few months but as we were talking about recording the Tory stuff or putting out the Tory stuff right but like yeah. yeah what what is what is that jump from you wanting to be a poet to seeing that there was some kind of almost like infrastructure that it'd be interesting to try and help build around poets and spoken word artists i think linking to what i was saying earlier about being so impatient um if you write in poetry everybody the first question people ask you is are you published um, and as somebody, maybe it's partly because I'm working class, but the, the thought of being published, A, seemed really alien to me, but also B, um, if you are going to be published, it'll, it might take you a year to write a book and then a year to find a publisher and then a year for it to be printed. Not that it always takes three years from start to finish, but it's a very, very long process. Whereas technically you could record an album and upload it to Bandcamp or SoundCloud or whatever, you know, not much as you don't want to rush it, you could do it in a day. And so it was the accessible nature of it, but also like, I've fallen in love with so many poets on stage and then gone and bought the book and enjoyed it. And I just think like for someone like me who didn't grow up reading poetry and wouldn't necessarily go to Waterstones and spend 100 quid in the poetry section, I might hear someone saying it at a festival and I might hear someone saying it on YouTube and that's how I got into it. And so I just thought there were a gap in the market because sometimes you, you go to check out a poet online and there's a load of YouTube videos that were filmed at gigs and the phone's sideways and it's crap and it's shaking, you can't really hear them. So I just wanted some like really good quality uh, content online. So like putting out an audio album, that is something that's been 
thought about, it's been produced, it's like, this is what I want you to hear, rather than that poem I did six years ago, but someone else uploaded and I can't get them to delete, even though it's terrible, which we can all relate to. So yeah, that's why. <laughs> yeah, and I guess and I guess also maybe because you come over from music, maybe just taking almost the, the structure of how music releases happen, um, but applying it to spoken word and poetry, right? Yeah, I think I think my experience in the music industry informed it a lot, and I sort of approached running it. Did you just see Maria there, by the way? Maria's here, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Maria. Hi. <laughs> um, <laughs> hi. Hi. <laughs> Maria's got dressed up as well. Everyone's got dressed up apart from. Oh no, Jack is wearing. <laughs> um, nothing. So yeah, no, I did approach it using my music industry sort of experience. Um. All right, mate. Well, look, let's chat again in a bit, but I think we'll go to Louise now, if that's all right. Jack. Great chatting, man. Always. You, mate. Oh, just so everyone knows, by the way, Jack is like the other half of Nims and Pugs. He operates largely in the background. Well, uh, and half is a bit strong. I think half's yeah. a bit strong, but a style of like an element if of... If it wasn't for his advice... Element, yeah. his, uh, his I might get in the bath at some point, so you might get my Facebook profile picture rather than me in the bath, so... Sure, that's a good shout. If it wasn't for your advice and guidance and ideas and energy, though, I'd, I'd, I'd find it a lot harder. So thank you, mate. Uh, it's a pleasure, man. It's a pleasure Cheers, doing stuff Jack. with you, it really is. Good. Cheers, mate. Have a nice bath. <laughs> <laughs> right. I'm going to mute everybody apart from Louise. I'm not being rude. Oh, wait, Kevin is muted. That's all right. It's just because if you laugh or say something or clap, then it'll take the sound away. So, Louise Fazakale, you were the first person to sign to the label. Um, because I, I had this idea for a label, but I didn't tell anyone, tell anyone about it. And then you put something on Facebook saying, oh, I've got these two albums, what do I do with them? And I rang you and this happened. <laughs> Can you remember that? Yeah, I do, because I'd just moved into a different house. Um, and I was in the garden when I saw your uh, message saying, I'm going to set up a label. Do you want to be on it? And I was like, yeah. Um, because like you, I also thought like the work's better being heard and being watched and stuff, ne not necessarily amazing on the page. Um, like, I mean, it's good on the page and it's got on the page now, but it's just a different sort of thing. So I was really keen to just kind of get out there on a uh, on an audio. Yeah, good. So it just sort of fell into place, didn't it? Because I'd seen you at uh, Poetry in a Pine. John Darwin asked you to perform, didn't he? So I'd seen you perform there. And so we're not known each other that long and it all just sort of fell into place. That's good, isn't it? Yeah, and I think you're a good talent scout, Matt. I think, like, everyone you've got on the label is really good. So, like, I never go to Nims and Fugs gig and think, well, I wonder who else is on. I always think, yeah, Matt's a good programmer. So oh, that's, that's, nice. that's good to know. Thank you. Um, all right, so shall I hand it over to you and you can do a couple of poems for us? Yeah, and Matt, if I, I don't think I'll overrun, but if it looks like I am, will you just do I'll something? I'll just put my hand up for some, yeah. All right, yeah. no worries. Get it off, get it off, exactly. Okay, over to you. I'm going to mute, mute myself. Okay. <laughs> okay. Hi, everybody. Um, so I have set up, you know, a little stage in my living room. I don't know if you can hear the dog barking next door, the cats fighting, or indeed my trainers. Because, I mean, obviously I've got my, you know, my germans and my trainers at the bottom half of this glamorous outfit, like everyone else does on Zoom. Um, so I thought I'd start with... Um, two pieces from Council House Poetry, which if you come to any of some Bugs gigs, I, I would often start with, so I thought I'd start with two favourites. So the first one is called Angie's Horse, and it's about the first time I ever rode on a horse, and maybe it's a little bit about education. So this is Angie's Horse. Estate rats, we run the maze with ease to a triangle green between the high rise flat. This girl, she brings this horse from nowhere. This young brown horse to our arena. A sign pauses in its fall. A stuttering tick at 10 to 10, at 10 to 10, at 10 to 10, 10 to 10, 10, 10. It's cowboy time. A sign pauses. In its fall, a stuttering ticket, ten to no, all games allowed. And it's too hot to stay in, bovine packed. The families are out, out, out. The pensioners asleep. 
leaving us the in-betweens. We line up to take turns. Angular boys, streets of girls. Angular boys, streets of girls. Shut the fuck up, you scary ass. When so much glass has been smashed, the fragments are beautiful. Uh, alleys and ginnels and cut-throughs are a tarmac sky waiting for waves of change and a gallop of children. The sea, we rub each other's tide marks, a circumference of cheap. And I had never ever been on a horse, my go. My goal goes too quick and I don't vault a star from this carousel cause wooden desks don't work as wings. Instead, I watch perms bounce like pogo sticks until the sweating horse has had enough. A scalene shape left on the grass cause nothing is equilateral here. They don't want us to be winged horses, they want us to be wolves or sheep, easily led or benefits, cheats, but we rise, we rise from benefit street and we find constellations to leap. Oh, thank you. Uh, I like, I really like the silent clapping. <laughs> Okay, um, what am I doing next? I've got, oh yeah. So um, next up I'll do um, my other sort of like crowd pleaser, um, what people just ask for sometimes. Um, it's called Bird Street and it's like the eponymous poem for the album that's inside Council House Poetry. Um, so this is Bird Street and it's based on this house in which I live in now, I'm back in my old house. Uh, it's on a terrace road and down the road there was a house where they had some problems with addiction and one of the women knocked on my door, and this is what happened, it's called Bird Street. Knock, knock, knock. There's a beggar at the door. There's a baghead at the door. There's a fallen angel. There's a woman, she's a whore. Saint Murray of Methadone knocking to come in. Child, sized, needle, thighs, questioning me with lucid eyes, her. Does anyone keep pigeons on this street? Me, Jesus Christ, why do I always attract the freaks? Are you still there? Yeah, sorry, I had a little battery sign, yeah. <laughs> ah! Okay, uh, pigeons, yeah, but me, do I always, why do I always attract the freaks, her? I found this pigeon, it's struggling to breathe me. Pigeons are dirty, they carry disease. There's a rat with wings, there's a rat with wings, there's a fallen angel, there's a struggling thing. No vet for a pigeon, no RSPCA, and who will help this smackhead today? Me. Uh, well, I don't keep pigeons, but she shoves. A dying hope in a plastic bag through the crack in the door, through the crack of a chance in my pause for thought. I'm no omnipotent ornithologist. Is it a pigeon or is it a dove? Me, revulsion, her, love. I'll knock on another door, Mrs. Dirty, blonde, feathers, fast, racing, heart, blast. Flat breath, no last rites for a pigeon. A paper sign in Murray's window, house to let, will accept DSS and pets. Fumigators in and vermins out, and my house stinks of death and faith and doubt. Thank you. <laughs> Silent applause. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. Okay, super. Thank you. Um, 
I'm going to do, what am I going to do next? Oh yeah, I'm going to do something from my new book, The Lolitas, which I've not recorded yet for um, Nymphs and Bugs, but I will. You might notice my freckles, which, you know, are natural. Uh, I saw a, a really amazing, like, song woman called Molusca, and she had some, I thought, well, I'm having some. Um, what am I doing this now? Oh yeah, okay. I'll just do one poem out of here, because I think time is ticking. Page 19. Okay, so um, this book, yeah, this book is a, an exploration of like the triangle in the Lolita text, the initial uh, original text, where there's like Lolita, the wayward teenage girl, um, her mum, the single mum, and the stepdad, who in the books are pervert, but they aren't all. So um, I thought I'd share this poem about me being a teenager, and it's just a nice poem about first kisses. The book is quite dark, there are some darker ones in it, but this one's nice. Okay, plain rounders. Grass shouldered, the orange brick wall as my back, scratch air as sought after stubble. Flamingo legged, I lean, 13, trying to be smaller. Apple head, Adam. His bowl caught beatnik straight. First base, not base. My brace burst the bubble and the lip of his peachy face. Every night after that, like suction cups, we are stuck together. Chewing gum arms in the waltz position. Tilted heads. He goes away kayaking with his sink school to burnt pink weeks in the Ardesh. His boyish, buoyant postcard navigates the stars. Too late, sucker, sucker punch. I cop with dear John, his best mate, the backstop. Love and other indoor sports, Louise. Kiss, kiss, kiss. Thank you. Um, when I was writing, oh, I've been clapping, but I can keep talking, can't I? Because I can't hear the clapping. Um, when I wrote this, I was looking through my teenage diaries and I, I realised I, I kind of signed a lot of things, love and other indoor sports. That was my favourite sign off. So, you know, if you buy the book, I'll sign that in my book for you. Look on my website. Okay, um, I think I'm just going to finish now with one poem um, that's quite new out of, out of the Bird Street book. Yeah, product placement. I've got this with nymphs and fugs. Bye, bye, bye. If you want to read, read, read it, you can read, read, read it here. If you want to read something experimental and crazy, it's here. Okay, I'm sorry. Last poem. I, I get a bit excited in my own house because I can't see any of the audience. So I don't know if you think I'm an idiot. I just think, yeah, this seems fine to me. Um, I think it's page 26, this. Yeah. Okay, because I've been touring with John Cooper Clark and um, Tony Walsh. Like, I've loads of, um, like like it went up really big from his Manchester poems. This poem is a bit like influenced by John Cooper Clark and um, Tony Walsh and the punk scene. It's kind of the closest I get to a vaguely punk poem. It's called Nothing Town. It's rollers in Primark, hashtag cute onesies uptown. Is it Saturday, proles? The nailing us down. And it's nothing but skint, and it's nothing but tight, and it's nothing but nooses in the woods in the night. So we shoot up Sambuca, remember Diamond White, ride the Christmas whiskey turkeys, cause everything's all right. What's your poison, love? We're back to bathtub gym and we're foaming in Prosecco and we cannot feel a thing. It's nightclubs in a nothing town. It's nightclubs in a nothing town and it's nothing but girls and it's nothing but lads and it's single mums and weekend dads and it's nothing but Tinder and it's nothing but grinder. And it's slot drops in Bentleys and your mate grinds behind you. And it's nothing but grime and it's fucking sublime. And it's nothing but workers off call centre time. And it's nothing but 80s and 90s and noughties. Fat girls in the teens, bald men in the 40s. And it's nothing but human. 
and it's nothing but escape. If I took a few stills, it could hang in the Tate. And this, this is working class culture, baby. And it's nightclubs in a nothing town, and it's nightclubs in a nothing town, and it's 4 a.m. chips and icicle nips. I could hang my coat on him. Do you think that he's fit? And chili sauce dresses and sea scale hips and a few pools of sick that we judge as we skip. And it's nothing but sticky and it's nothing but nice and it's nothing but tacky and the homeless on spice and it's nothing but ten to strangers at the ATM sharing some backy at the end of the night and it's nightclubs in a nothing town and it's nightclubs in a nothing town and it's not making waves. And the sink of the stellar, it's a daily mail shocker as a kid stabs a fella and nothing is left and everything is wrong. But just keep on drinking and forget riot songs. And it's nothing but beak and it's nothing but bike and it's nothing fake news and the rise of the right. And it's nothing but light and it's nothing but wolf. And it's nothing but pigeons rising as doves. And it's nothing but Tommies. And it's nothing but bait. Sharks in t-shirts saying, isn't capitalism great? And it's nothing but, and it's nothing but, and it's nothing but lubricating the machine. And it's nothing but, and it's nothing but living the conservative dream. Fuck the Tories. Woo! That's it. That's my set. <laughs> that were amazing. Thank you so much. That were absolutely class. Did you enjoy it? Yeah, I love it. I love a bit of showing off in my front room. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. Um, so where can we get those? Where's the best place for us to buy those books? Well, obviously, go on Nims and Fugs and get your uh, Councilized Poultry CDs. It's also got my, um, you can see my little dog head there. It's also got um, Love is a Battlefield, which is a commission I did for BBC Radio 3, um, which is lovely on it. And it's got some puns from Bird Street. And then if you want Lolita's or Bird Street, probably go on my website because I'd make more money than going to the publishers, even though I love the publishers. And you could go to the publishers and buy the Lolita's and loads of other books like Matt's book. Uh, and that's louisethepoet.co.uk, is that right? I think it is, yeah. So you could follow me at Louise the Poet and then the links are on there, guys. Jobs are good in. Thank you, Louise. You're a star. Thank you. What are you going to do now? You've got to mute me and go on to the next mute, person. I'll mute you now and then go to Kevin. <laughs> And I can get a drink. Will yeah. I still on the teller? Uh, if you want to be, you can disable your video if you want. It's up to you. Oh, uh, all right. I think I'll stay on for a bit and then I might disable it and watch it on Facebook. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, whatever you want. I'm sorry. I'm just chatting in between. Oh, no, that's cool. That's cool. All right. Okay. Bye. Bye. Good luck, everybody. Love you all. Bye. Kevin P. Gilday. How are you doing? Are oh, you muted? Are you? Oh, no, you're not. You all right? I'm good, man. How are you? Good thanks. Oh, well, having a slight panic attack still about the fact that Tori you can't get in for some reason. Did you get in all right? I got in all right, yeah. I just uh, pressed the link and then I came in and that was it. Did you have to put a password in? Nah. That's weird. Oh, well, whatever. You're here. <laughs> and we'll get Tori in somehow. Um, right, so Kevin P. Gilday, you have actually released a musical album with Nims and Fugs. It was co-released with Iffy Folk Records, wasn't it? Can you tell us about Kevin P. Gilday and the Glasgow Cross? Yeah, so it was basically a collaboration between myself and my mate Ralph, who's an amazing kind of composer and multi-instrumental kind of musician. Um, so he decided he was going to kind of compose some music to go with some of my poems. Um, then we ended up making this amazing album where it was kind of, um, some of the poems were recorded as just spoken word pieces. And other, yeah. pieces, other poems were kind of turned into kind of post-punk tracks, basically, or like kind of weird jazz instrumentals. And uh, yeah, it was a really great experience. And it kind of what started off as like a one-off kind of collaboration has now became a, a massive thing. And we're kind of going to be releasing our, our second album um, later on next month. So... Yeah, what started off as an, a wee project has become this massive part of my life, so it's pretty amazing. amazing. Cool, and it, it's out on vinyl, isn't it, through Ify Folk? Double vinyl. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we've got limited edition vinyl as well, it's good. Nice, that's amazing. So, um, obviously Ralph's not with you tonight because of social distancing, so you're going to do some 
spoken word for us, which is probably what you're most known for, isn't it? I know you write scripts and you write plays and you write music and stuff. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, I like to try out different art forms and I like to challenge myself with different things. But, you know, the, the poetry was the first thing that, that I'd done that people actually liked. So I tend to go back to that one more often, do you know what I mean? Well, let's have some uh, hardcore, neat, straight up on the rocks poetry. Uh, yeah. I'm going to mute myself now and hand over to the floor to uh, Kevin Peagle there. Cool. Thank you, mate. Okay. Um, I hope you're all okay out there in the uh, Facebook and YouTube land. Uh, I'm going to just read a few poems for you. Um, and yeah, just just have a laugh, hopefully, and, you know, give you a wee bit of a distraction from the fucking overwhelmingly boring monotony of living uh, under lockdown. But, yeah, here's here's a wee one about... Well, I'm going to say it's a bit... It's a bit of an introduction to me, but it's also uh, a poem about about loving the booze. It's called The Man Who Loved Beer. Some of you may be aware, perhaps some of you here, that I'm Kevin P. Day, and I'm the man who loves beer. I'm an alehouse resident. A can carrying man, an amber elixir and biber, a pipe swallowing bat, an alcoholic interloper forever available for a drink, with an etch a sketch diary. There's no plans, I won't sink. For a night out, for a quick one, for a lunchtime beverage, for a night in, for a nightcap, for early morning leverage, for a swift one, for a cure, for a Sunday session, for the hair of a dog, for a few tins, for a late night lesson, and how to drink with the best in it. And just vomit ridden stupor. And get right back on it without complaint. You can't say I'm not a trooper. Dedicated to the cause. Field Marshal General of the drink. With strategic intelligence of my targets. Instinctively aware of the nearest clink. Of glasses shared between lovers. Acquaintances and friends. Stories regaled of stupendous feats. Bridges burned and made amends. The booze seeps into my blood. Just a trickle and then a flood. It coils around my brain. A calmness spreads across my chest. My anxiety soon arrests, replaced instead with a yearning for Jeremy. And you might let me fuck you now after I charm and wear and beg. But will you still love me tomorrow when I have shit running down my leg? When the poison does its spitting, capillaries swell and explode as bile is ejected and stomach lining erodes. And I pray for some god to take me to heaven, Valhalla, or the pub. Well, the antidote awaits me, and therein lies the rub, the comfort, the hunger, the thirst, the craving, the longing, the lust, the demand, the desire to feed, the urge, the want, the need for an artificial aid, social vibrator, personality lubrication, conversation stimulator, and maybe one day it will kill me, and those flags will fly half mast. But friends and lovers will tell stories, share a joke and raise a glass. Chisel it on my gravestone. The man who rests here is Kevin P. Day, the man who loved beer. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Um, okay. Uh, I'm going to do a, a new one just now. This is the only coronavirus related shit I'm going to do okay once I've done this that's it we won't need to mention it again because it's all we've been talking about and it's boring as fuck um so this is a, a poem um that I wrote the other day and it was based on the fact that my my mate's kid had sent me a wee video message and he was like yeah Kevin when you come to visit me 
and I was like, "Fuck! How do I explain to a like a three year old that you you can come and visit them?" You know. Um, so yeah, this is about that. It's uh, called uh, a question from Tom. When are you coming to visit? Tom asks. I have a wee cry and wonder myself. What should be a simple question now stretches itself out, makes itself comfortable on the couch, here for the long run. It casts its hook into the horizon, distorts normality with its ripples, fishing for the remnants of my future. I'll visit when it's over, when the government says so. When the scientists have signed off, when the world has changed, when the system falls, when the revolution comes in the future, when all's well. And who will you be then, grown further into your fledgling humanity, personality blooming, those building blocks coming together like Lego bricks on your bedroom floor? We sit in stasis. Scared to move? Will you take evolutionary leaps daily? Unaware of borders closing, you see tomorrow open with possibilities. Your world is small and I envy you. You make epic odysseys to the garden, front and back. You create a tableau of toys in the living room, make a meal out of dinner time. The world has not lost its wonder, nor life its luster. You are present, a gift, and the universe makes perfect sense through your sparkling eyes. You do not know that you are missed, that family would march across continents to see you if only they could, but for now they will hold contentment gently in their hands, in a smartphone, watch an image of you grow in high resolution and try to be thankful. When are you coming to visit? Tom asks, and it vexes like an extended equation because questions need answers. And I don't have one. Soon, I say, really soon. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to be dangerous now um, and I'm going to say, Matt, Selena and Louise, do you want to turn your mics on for a second and help me with this poem? I'll turn, I'll turn everyone's on. Hold on. Okay. Oh, Tori is here as well. Tori is here, yes. I know. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right. So th this is one that usually has audience participation. Okay, I'm ready. Maybe you, you can help me out with this instead. Um, so, Matt, um, I want you to be the howling wind for me. Could you give me some howling wind? I'm shy. I'm doing <laughs> <laughs> it's howling. It's definitely howling. That's better, that's better. But we'll work it out as we go along. Um, <laughs> Lena, would you like to do some lashing rain? Cool. It's very expressive. I like it a lot. <laughs> okay. And uh, Louise and Victoria, since you're here, um, how about you do this very important part for me, okay? I want you to do your very best impression of a slightly perturbed Heather. <laughs> do that for me. A slightly perturbed Heather. Go for it. Like the plant? Like the plant. Um, you know what? I'm going to leave this to you, Louise. <laughs> <laughs> um, does it have to have a noise? It yeah. has to have a noise. <laughs> Okay, let's workshop this as we go, okay? So this is a poem about, um, it's about Scottish identity and it's about this idea of Caledonian anti-syzygy, which is the idea that, that Scottish people are personalities kind of split in two. We always have binary oppositions fighting within us. 
Um, and to really demonstrate that, I want to recreate the Scottish weather, which is where you're all going to come in, okay? So, My dad's Scottish, Kevin. Okay, well, the, the perturbed heather is in your blood then. Just harness it. Just feel it, okay? <laughs> okay, this poem's called My Quantum Scotland. This is not a country. It is a contradiction shaped as a landmass. A polarity carved carelessly into ancient hills. A dual personality imbued into every brick of our grand cities. A wound bound together by a shared history of oppression and the occasional sporting near miss. We are a binary people. A simultaneous society, split personality, two places at once. Because this is a land of Catholics and Protestants, Celtic and Rangers, Glasgow and Edinburgh, Jekyll and Hyde, Nationalists and Unionists, Remainers and Leavers, yes and no, where the wind towels. And the rain lashes, and the heather is slightly perturbed. <laughs> and this explains <laughs> the listlessness that permeates, the rift at the centre of my Caledonian heart, because you buffed me, all misshapen and angry. And here I am, yours truly, and truly yours, my quantum Scotland. Caledonian antisysogy, a constantly repeated anomaly, square pegs and round holes, the jigsaw pieces on the other side of the board forced into imperfect union. There are two of us living side by side, forever in dispute, like warring sons of fractious neighbours, because this is a land of highlands and lowlands, landy gentry and slum dwellers, Bears Den and Drum Chapel, Beaujolais and Buckfast, cyber nuts and gnaw bags, salt and vinegar and salt and sauce, Mogwai and the Proclaimers, no and yes, where the wind towels and the rain lashes, and the heather is slightly perturbed. <laughs> and this explains <laughs> the listlessness that permeates the rift at the centre of my Caledonian heart because you buffed me all misshapen and angry. And here I am, yours truly and truly yours, my quantum Scotland. How did we get this far? With a fatal injury inflicted in our infancy, the blood trail annotating our journey, the cleaving apart of a society. Open the shop red tin in the wardrobe, liberate the needle and thread, and stitch these two cloths together until something resembles a nation where the wind towels and the rain lashes. And the heather is slightly perturbed. Oh. Thank you very much. Oh, that was lovely. And uh, it was actually quite a good heather. Lots of people go for that high pitched sound, weirdly enough. Like that's what a heather might sound like. I love that that's what Luke can joined. say. Luke's so joined. Hello. Yeah, it was great. Oh, hey, how are you doing? Doing all the sound effects like the second time. That's what he <laughs> joined that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Back to you, Kev, sorry. Um, so this year, there is no Edinburgh Fringe, um, which is sad news for lots of people, mainly landlords in Edinburgh. Um, but also artists who were looking forward to performing a show and were kind of rehearsing something or writing something. Um, 
I have a kind of love hate relationship with the Edinburgh Fringe. Um, I like going there and I like, you know, taking my art to an audience and um, an international audience at that. Um, but, you know, I kind of despise the fact that it's this massive money making scheme for a few massive companies and some landlords and some pubs as well as being the weird summer holiday for every bad drama student from London. Um, so, <laughs> Maria, come on. I said bad drama student. Come on. Okay. So I wrote this poem about it. It's very wittily titled, Why I Fucking Hate the Edinburgh Fringe. It goes like this. <clears throat> A city full of attention seekers, certified cunt convention, confidence black hole, wild dreams of audience retention, mental exhaustion, relentless and tiring, being flyered by arseholes, being the arsehole flyering, self-inflicted scurvy, soggy chips on the menu, performing in a bona fide cupboard, PBH putting you on in this fucking venue. Every square inch an advert. Billboards obscure the greenery. Being forced to endure amateur Sunday actors chewing the scenery. August in Edinburgh. Someone get these clowns an editor. They're charging money for an hour of this pish. Earn this self-importance is rife. The Guardian supplement come to life. A modicum of awareness, my part and wish. Fannies on unicycles, wankers on stouts. You've got your old ma crying in a quilt. Performance artists, part-time magicians. Your da can't work under these conditions. Stop being an embarrassment, failed child actor. Those dance lessons were a bust. Now you've taken up being a wanker. But mime is in my blood, you cry. This art is my compulsion. Just a few grand in government grants, then we'll really see some propulsion. But it's simple supply and demand, my friend. And this festival is ruthless. There's no room here for soggy fops, artisans, naive and toothless. So don't feel disheartened if your audience halves when some cunt goes to the loo. After all, they're only in town to see that comedian from Have I Got News For You. Cheers. Thank you. Um, I'm going to barter through another couple quickly um, and then we can move on to the next person. Um, lots of these are in my newest book, Sad Songs for White Boys, um, that was uh, out last year. It's out on speculative books, but you can get it through my website as well. Um, yeah, so I'm going to do this one. This is a poem about how I hate all other poets. Kev? Yeah? Sorry, hold on, you, your mic's gone a little bit funny. Have you done something different? No, I don't think so, mate. Has it gone really quiet for everyone else? Or is it just me? Uh, it's just me being a dick, sorry, carry on. Okay, anybody else hear me okay? Good, okay. It's called I Fallen Out of Love with Poetry. I've fallen out of love with poetry. It's no me, it's you. That spark has gone wandering amidst countless painful open mics, anxiety inducing slams, clique politics, and the complete absence of ever being paid. I've fallen out of love with poetry because of your fucking whiny voices and earnest subject matter, contrivedly crafted for universal agreement. I'm glad we've sorted out that racism is bad. I was a wee bit sketchy before you took the mic. I've fallen out of love with poetry, with your mid-Atlantic inflections and borrowed speech patterns, because you all learned to slam from Americans on YouTube. 
instead of saying what you feel. I've fallen out of love with poetry because your body issues are not important. Unlike mine. Of course you're an outsider. You read fucking poetry. This is a club for weirdos. This much we know. I've fallen out of love with poetry. Because you write too many love poems and they don't come easily to me. Grand metaphors like quixotic sculpture shone from the marble of your affections or something. I've fallen out of love with poetry because rhyming is seen as uncool despite it being a useful linguistic tool. I literally device talk to kids at School, yet I stand up here like a mawkish ghoul Cause my poetic preference marks me out as a fool Or something I've fallen out of love with poetry Cause these young people Are actually quite good And maybe there's no room for a grown man's Weary compositions And chronic oversharing I've fallen out of love with poetry because it's fallen out of love with me. Thank you. Okay. Just a quick one and I'll be on my way. This is very important information that you need in your life just now. It's very, very important. This is a guide. This is how to spot a Tory. If you don't say cheers mate when you got off the bus then you're probably a Tory. If you don't watch The Simpsons at six o'clock then you're probably a Tory. If you've never been sick at the Pleasure Beach in Blackpool then you're probably a Tory. If you've never had to use a coin star machine to buy a bottle of wine, then you're probably a Tory. If you're not sure what football team you support, then you're probably a Tory. If you're unsure of the etiquette in regards to your granny being on a bus, then you're probably a Tory. If you didn't have a party when Thatcher died, then you're probably a Tory. If you don't shout, get it right up ye, you old cunt! Every time the Queen is on the telly, then you're probably a Tory. If you don't lament the loss of gingy bottles as a self-contained economic currency, then you're probably a Tory. If you get someone else to iron your clothes, in fact, if you even iron your clothes, then you're probably a Tory. But if you think that wealth trickles down, that doctors are overpaid, that immigration is a road in the country, that privatisation is the key, that poverty is a myth, then you're definitely a fucking Tory. Thank you very much. I've been Kevin Peagle Day. Uh, thank you very much to Matt and the team for having me. I hope you enjoy the rest of your night. Cheers, Kev. I thought you were doing like some fancy. It's kevinpgilday.co.uk, is that right? Uh, .co.uk or .com. It either will get you there. Cool. Good thinking. Cheers, mate. Thank you very much. Cheers, man. Thank you. Toria Garbutt, how are you doing? Hello, Matt Abbott. I'm, I'm here. I'm well. I'm over yeah. the moon. I'm sorry, but it was a bit of a, a tech nightmare for you, mate, but I'm glad you're here now. It's all good. Life wouldn't be the same without that um, sort of like knife edge anxiety before a gig. I, I'm quite thrilled, really. 
Um, what? Yeah. Oh, um, yeah. No, you're right. So I'm glad that you're here. So you you joined in 2016 and you released Hot Plastic Moon, and we did a crowdfunding campaign, and then you started touring with Johnny Clark, and it all just blew up, didn't it? That's correct, Matt Abbott. It all just blew up in the sky like a rocket. Things happened really quickly. Um, things happen in a mad whirlwind, actually, and I'm only just starting to slow down and reflect. And go, that's, been a, that's been a busy few years, you know. Yeah. And uh, I'm definitely at a point now of, of stopping and uh, reflecting. Fair enough, mate. Sounds like a good place to be. Um, so I'll I'll hand over to you if that's all right. Do a couple of poems for us. I just oh. want to say hello properly to Luke as well. Sorry before we start. Hello, Luke. You're all right, mate. Thanks for joining us. Right. So over to you, Tori Garbutt. Matt, I just want to say hello to everybody as well. Hello, everybody. You cannot save the world, sweet child. Cannot make your mum come back or your dad less violent. I see you writing diaries, praying, crying, staying silent. It's okay to speak. It's okay to say, stop, I don't want it. None of it is your fault and you cannot fix it. It gets better, sweet child. You'll grow out of your puppy fat armor. You'll get tall and loud and attract the wrong attention and fall into the wrong crowd. But you can still say no. You don't have to fuck them all to spare their feelings. Don't have to lay there, wincing, open legs, staring up at our tech ceilings. I want you to know that I love you and that you are enough exactly as you are, small thing. Let yourself stay in. Go to your grandma's and read books. Keep your lungs and conscience clean. Please, sweet thing, whatever you do, just don't fall for him. Thank you. Okay. Thanks ever so much. This next one's called Subway. That in between space in Ferry Shop Square, where girls and boys can kiss, Bit, kick bin, sweat, shiver and swear. Gob off at coppers, spray words on wall like bars for shaz, TLFE. Or I was here, IDFP, just hanging around drinking 2020. Yeah, mate, I was here. For some reason, I never rate understood, right here in Notler instead of Hollywood in 1933. Nah, not me, mate. I were here, Notler, 1993. Where Tracy's got AIDS and Shaz is a slag and Twocko's a cuff and Tina's on Skag and Patches don't fucking belong over here. Yeah, that's where I were, mate. I was here. I've driven through it. Everyone goes that in between place that nobody knows where nobody's been and nobody's stopped in case the fucking wheel trims get ripped off. Nobody's had a sarnie on Racker Green. Nobody's stopped at Morag for a pot of hot tea now. Nah, nobody's been through Snicket at back of GTs where the words are still on wall from 1984. Thatcher, fuck us. Thank you. Thanks ever so much. Don't tell me that it's my last day on earth. I will only spoil it by over planning. I know I'll get it wrong and cry because it's not how I imagined because my idea of perfect was not right. Please for one last day and one last night, just leave us to be us. Let me run big blue baths like incense fall asleep. Let me make hot chocolate and kiss your silly cheeks. Let me tuss at your daft blast of song. Let me get it wrong and be sorry. Let me make amends. Let's laugh and laugh and keep it going for ages till it's painful and I might wee. Let me not have an inkling of knowing, only feelings of hope, only feelings of love. Please, for one last day and one last night, just let us be us. Thank you. This is, um, This is an oldish one, it's The Universe and Me. I named my book after it. If you buy one, they don't look like this. Dreadfully tacky copy. It's about, um, it's about a time in my life when we moved out of Nottingley to a little, um, a little village 
on the sort of like semi rural outskirts it's about then that in between space after school before tea just sunshine and telly and seti and me tired and happy and hollow and free just sunshine and telly and seti and me a waft of snags and mashing that comes curling across room and my mum's making up hot words to a 90s brit pop tune she's like girls who are boys who are boys who are girls who are dee 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 -de, you and me baby or bless a little socks off the soft and pink and cotton so probably had a bobbly cardi on but don't ask because i've forgotten she's cute and small and mumsy color swirling ballerina she's andy pandy bill and ben in our living room arena me mum, me mum. she's trotting span she's feeding our chihuahua she's teaching me the elegance of matriarchal power she's spinning plates on roller skates and serving with a smile she sat her ass on the toilet so she'll probably be a while it smells of snags and peas and mash and tastes like bisto gravy. It feels like third, it sounds like blurred, it's the air of Akatung, baby. It looks like suns and moons and stars and giant yellow teacups. It feels like docks and knee ice tops and marks and spencers teacups that in between space after tea before bed. When you're meant to do your own work, be watching friends instead, listening to Jim Morrison and floating out your head in a higher dimension than not less. Puffing on a Lambert on a pink blow up city in that in between space before bed and after tea, praying for forgiveness and praying to be free. Just the sunset and the moonlight and the universe and me. Thank you. Thanks ever so much. I'm going to have a little swig of this Bloody Mary. I'm enjoying it so much. What did that say, Selena Godden? Why are you being so mischievous? Oh, I love you. I love you all so much. All right, I'm gonna do. Um, I'm gonna do makeover. It's a poem about and for my sister, and I'm imagining that she probably ended up watching this on YouTube. So, uh, so this is for you. It's called Makeover. You were fifteen. I'm speeding that night. You give me a makeover. Your fingers smelt like nicotine, felt beautiful on my face. Firmly smudged foundation, removing all trace of child. Wild cat's eyes, all pupils, you smiled approval, we looked like twins. And I felt 10 feet tall that night. Bedazzled and bewitched by my own black eyes, I felt beautiful for the first time. And now I wanna do the same for you. Breathe love back into the darkest parts of you till your skin's pink and your breath's fresh. I can be your reflection at its best. Are you in? And are you in? Are you still in there? Because I'm struggling to see past your mottled skin and matted hair, but there are glances and daft laughs in my car while I drive you to rehab. Flashing chances of wit and spark, a distant sparkler in the dark, there are flecks of hope and kindness in your heart. I can feel it. You take off your necklace and you put it on me. And in that moment, Anne, I know that you saw it. Black memories fade to pink roses, identical eyes, identical voices, tech, my tongue and let it mech your choices those ones you taught me about fighting hard and breaking free your words and I give them back use them like cement last and fill the cracks remove or trace of pain and i'm writing you this while you're still alive i say those words without really letting them in inside because if i do they'll fucking kill me and we all will in world I can't detach from pain of never seeing my big sister again and I'm frightened. I don't want to be at your funeral. Head hung low, stomach thick with sick and sorrow, mouth agape in disbelief and wish I could have told you this. So here it is. And you are fucking beautiful. Rooted in good soil, you stand tall like a sunflower 
and dance a crack house is no castle for a princess i'm no way they can see you sparkle in darker lighter is no spotlight for a star do you remember do you remember how we used to imagine another world beneath quilts where we laid perfectly still and magic chocolate how you played upside down cobs on guitar bizarre the way that you did that that laugh that you braid on my behalf thanks for being my sister thanks for the doors and hole and nirvana and black eyeliner thanks for the times i've cried and you've made it better and yeah there have been shit ones too and i am so sorry for the hurt i've caused you but i can't be with you now it don't mean i don't love you and you're my sister and you're close to my heart too fucking close and you are the master of tearing it apart and it's fragile. I wish you well. I believe you can get clean. I believe that connection is the cure to your disease, that you can heal and spread your wings and be free. Thank you. Thanks ever so much. Um, I'm just gonna do I'm just gonna do one more actually. I am. Um, I wrote this poem last year, just after my son's 12th birthday. Um, I had postnatal depression when I had my first son, and uh, I had a realisation on his 12th birthday, and this poem's about that, it's called Good Man. So, Ma, today you are 12. Two giant silver balloons, a one and a two, suspended like moons. This daft animal song plays by accident instead of happy birthday on YouTube and I just laugh. For once I'm not crushed by imperfection, in fact, I prefer it. Your brother says, cause it's your birthday, you can punch me on arm. And you do. And that birthday buzz is snuffed like a candle. He cries and you're too hard on yourself, you've learned that from me. But this time I don't react. Today I am older too. Instead, I hold space for peace and calm and like all pain, it passes with forgiveness and acceptance and strong arms. We go out for breakfast, tell tales over toast. This waitress tells us about her son. We talk about all our sons, those sons we mother on behalf of others, she says. I can tell you're a good man. And for the first time, I let it land. I am, I am, I am. Thanks ever so much, everybody. Happy birthday to us. Thanks everyone for watching. Has Matt, has Matt gone somewhere? Is it still me? Hello, you all right? Sorry about that. Um, the sound fucked up on my laptop, so I've got my laptop on my knee doing all the hosting stuff. Um, but I'm on Maria's account on her laptop, so I can talk to you. <laughs> so it's not just it's not just it's us that are fucking up, Toy. It's 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 the whole world. Um, thank you, mate. That was beautiful. That was really special. I really appreciate that, Toria. Did you enjoy it? I enjoyed it very much, Matt. And I just wanted to say to you that if things were going smoothly, it just wouldn't be right, would it? So enjoy not really. By the chaos law. Hi Maria. Hello babe, you alright? Yes, thanks for helping me. So lovely to see your face. Darling. Cool, thanks Toy. Right, now I'm gonna, let's see if this will work. Luke's already unmuted, that's brilliant, cool. How are you doing Luke, you alright mate? Yeah, I'm alright, I'm just a bit exhausted and depressed, but other than that, really chipper. How many gigs have we done now, 41? Two. Yeah, I've done 42 now. 42, yeah. sorry, I do apologise. <laughs> and is yeah. this the only gig that you've done other than those, or have you been doing other ones as well? I've done um, I've done a couple of appearances on uh, Robert and Josie's Book Shambles, or Shambles, or wow. um, State Home Festival, and I did a thing called All the Webs of Stage uh, a few nights ago, uh, the graveyard slot. <laughs> You, so you'll be around 50 then you'll be around 50 mark in total it's get it's getting on for that I've, ne I've never done i've never done an unbroken run of 42 gigs before i tell you that i mean you know i'm starting to really you know really question my choices why do i do edinburgh fringe just do this in august 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. The rent will be cheaper, eh? <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, no, fair play to you, mate. It's incredible. Uh, so, Luke joined, you joined the label last year, didn't you? And released, we released 20 on 2LP Gatefold Vinyl. And it's new stuff and greatest hits from the 20 years. And it's a thing of beauty, isn't it? It is a thing of beauty. Well, I would say that it's got my face all over it, but um, yeah. I'm not sure Maria felt like that with thousands of copies of the of the record lying around your flat for weeks and weeks. And then, <laughs> to be fair, you've been you've been they've been going pretty quickly. So I can get I one from the kitchen if you'd yeah. like. <laughs> no, it's just, I've got them down there. We'll leave it. We'll leave it. Oh, fair play. <laughs> all right, mate. So I, I, shall, I, shall, <laughs> I shall mute myself and hand over to you. So you build for Luke Wright. Thank you very much. Hello everybody, nice to see you. Um, so this, I'm gonna do two, well I'm gonna do about four or five poems, but uh, two of them are new, and I'm gonna start with a new one. This is a lockdown poem, um, and I guess it comes from conversations I've been having with mates on video chat, um, planning in, in detail the nights out we'll have, which I don't actually think is a very useful activity. It just makes you long for it even more. And um, I, I don't know about you, but I've, I've been very good and very, very well behaved. And I've been going up for long walks and eating healthy food. And I'm fucking sick of my better self. So this is about uh, my desire to bring the devil back. It's called Bring Me My Devil. Yeah. Right. This virus saw my devil off and left me in the tutelage of my best self who turns out to be an archbishop, a haughty health fanatic, a McEwen smug lecturer in rimless half-moons, hell-bent on teaching me the names of trees or marching me across the April fields, ruddy as a campo, look, a copse. Now life is one long limber up in gym shorts with a tidy hem. I'm wading through a swamp of sourdough, playing chess by second-class post, blinded by order, bleached as pale as the concrete walls of a Soviet-era theatre. God, I miss my devil, shitting like a barn hole down my back, whispering his slanders in my ear. You wouldn't catch Jim clapping for the nurses or mucking in or queuing for the co-op. Fuck no, he'll be in some dive bar now out there in the Shadowlands, some place beyond our squeaky comprehension. But when they click the combination lock and set us free, I'll send for him. I'll drag him flailing from his cups and dunk him in the horse's trough. I'll scream for him to do his worst to me. Line him up and get him out. Unspool my weeks of hearty labour. Piss on all the ledgers of my soul. Oh, someone bring my devil back to me in a hot throng of leaking bodies and shared saliva at rank urinals in dark places thick with lockdown dust to rob me of my dreamless sleep to feed me saturated fats to mock me as I vomit on my boots and leave me spent and drooling on a stranger's blim pop ox fan couch. Oh, that's that one. Woo! Um... <laughs> Uh, right, what's next? Oh yeah, something very different. This is a poem about my dad. So when I was, uh, well, my dad likes making things. He's, he's a very talented engineer and woodworker. It's not what he did for his job. He, he went and worked uh, in an office in London all his, all his working life. And um, uh, I think it was um, no great um, fan of that really. And I think what he wants to do is just be in his workshop making things. And um, throughout my childhood, he made, um, these beautiful clocks, um, what they call skeleton clocks, where they, they're, they're from very early designs and the first sort of household clocks about sort of 200, 300 years ago. And all their workings are on display and then you display them in the glass domes. Um, and so this is a, a poem that references that and it's called Clocks. Condemned to office work in London, your workshop was your weekend refuge. The thick smell of machine grease, corkscrews of brass filings on the lino, and against the window, that colossal lathe, the colour of naval warships. Out of these industrial dens emerged the skeleton clocks you spent your weekends making. A hundred perfect bits machined in brass and displayed under the glass domes, you'd wear white gloves to lift each Sunday night, to deftly wind each tricky mechanism. And every January, you put them forward at the model engineers exhibition. Once I fought to stay awake to see you when you came home late. You crept into my room to uncase the gold medal you had won and whispered, pretty good, eh? You let me in. I know I never found the knack for making things or helping in the workshop. I learned from you the pride that comes with skill. 
and it's your clocks that come to mind now as I walk slowly through the cardiac wing, past doorway after doorway, framing grey-skinned men, balding and babyish in hospital gowns left open at the chest like shirts ripped in bar fights, almost missing you, so haggard with the IV in your arm, the clocks. I think about the clocks you filled our house with years ago, when we had all that time. So that's that one. Um, uh, very short one now. It's very short. Um, and this is, uh, I don't know about uh, anyone else who's experiencing the same thing, but um, I am um, being in, in lockdown and, and having to rearrange parenting means that I'm spending um, a lot um, more time talking to my ex and, um, you know, having to renegotiate the way that we deal with, uh, with, with the kids and all that sort of stuff. So this is uh, called X. We don't touch each other anymore. 12 years in a double bed down to business-like deals we can't bring ourselves to shake on. Not even an X at the end of a text. I'm not saying that I want to. I just wonder where we went. But today you sent a photo of our son. It stopped me as it flashed across my palm. We were there, in his face, in each other's arms. And uh, oh yeah, I, yeah. Uh, huh, huh. Um, one uh, one more short one. Don't know where it's gone. Oh fuck! Put it on the floor somewhere. Okay, let's just dive into the last one, eh? I'll spare you all. So this is um, a bit of a beast of a poem. So, so I'm, I'm working on these projects at the moment. I, I, I don't know how it's affected you guys, but um, I couldn't sit around and just let everything be cancelled. I couldn't let the main thing in my life just be cancellations and reduction of all the things that we had going on. Like I was, you know, had a full summer of gigs, a full tour planned and all that. And the moment the cancellations started coming in, I just, I, you know, I, I didn't want that to be my driving narrative. So I've thrown, I threw myself into new stuff. So I, so I do these gigs on Twitter every night at 8 p.m. So as previously discussed, we're up to gig number 42 now. And so that was something to look forward to, something positive. And I also threw myself into a new writing project. So I'm rewriting a series of broadside ballads from Georgian times. I've written one of these before. I wrote one about five years ago. And I always thought back then I'd quite like to do a whole series of them. But, you know, who's got the time to sit there reading ballads from the, from the early 19th century? Um, and so I'm, I'm doing it now. And so, so back, in, back in Georgian times, we, we got our, our news from poetry. Even before we had sort of local newspapers, uh, we had the broadside ballads, which were large sheets of paper printed on one side um, with rhyming verse. And this rhyming verse told stories that were going on at the time. The sort of stories perhaps we'll find a way into a tabloid now, salacious, gossipy stuff, the juicy stuff, the stuff that you want to read about. Not, you know, fiscal matters or great matters of state, but the sort of you know, human interest stuff. Um, and um, these stories are great, but they're really badly written because they're written very, very quickly um, by people who weren't particularly good writers and just quickly for money, basically. So I wanted to take some of these stories or, or what they hit, they, they hint at a story that perhaps isn't actually there in a the text. You, you know, there's got to be more there, but they tend to be sort of more sort of almost more owed like the, the, the narrative, really. They, they, they just talk, you know, in the present about this character, you know, who did these things, but doesn't actually take you through in the story. And so I wanted to make stories of these. And this is um, about a guy called Jemmy the Rockman, as he was known. He was known Jemmy the Rockman, not because he was a crack dealer, um, although maybe today he would be a crack dealer, who knows, but he, because he sold, sold rock candy sweets. Incidentally, I should say, when you, if you saw me sniffing earlier, I was uh, talking of drugs, it was just, uh, it was just um, uh, this is um, snuff. And the reason I got some snuff is because this character was a big uh, snuff sniffer. So I'm going to have a sniff of snuff and then I'm going to tell you the story of Jemmy the Rockman. This will make my eyes water, as it always does. <sighs> oh, fuck. Right. It's horrible. Why does anyone do it? Why do I do it? You know, I've got a house. I'm, 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 I'm a regular guy. I could just watch telly. Why am I sniffing snuff and reading poems into the night? Anyway, this is the last poem I'm going to do. Thanks for having me, Matt. Thanks for having me just generally, having me on this wonderful label. And really nice to see all of your faces. So this is the Ballad of Jemmy the Rock Man, and I'm going out on this one. 
Want a ballad? Course you do. A burst of verse and plot now. Are you sitting comfortably? No matter if you're not, because I am a master of this ballad form. It's true. It's said that when I hit my stride, the hardest chapel pew becomes a well-sprung lazy boy. Best sit you've had in weeks, so part your derriere and let me words caress your cheeks and slap them every now and then. Yes, that's right. Say my name. And know if the scant chicken goes off at a tangent, I'll stop and pull it back again. And so, to Jimmy the Rock Man, hawking rough rock candy sweets, his son bleached army jacket lighting up the brummy streets composition composition good for calf or cold his eyes are lined his larynx cracked it's hard to say how old our hero is because his beard obscures his bisted chops and stretches to his navel in a reek of snuff and hops but i'll pin his age up 40 odd and every one of those sat heavy on his one good eye and ripe refurbished clothes as Jemmy tramped the bull ring to the rains and haze and frost. Calm position, calm position, good for a cold or a cough. Is Norfolk Burr familiar in England's second city? Busking, hawking, drinking hard. His tales were tall and witty. And anyone who drank with Jemmy knew these stories well. They'd fill his cup and egg him on till landlords tolled their bells. I took the old king's shilling. That's how I got this coat. And when I weren't quite 18 years, I sailed off on a boat. His yarns bejeweled with foreign names like Malta and Gibraltar, Egypt and Paraxel. Jemmy's soft voice didn't falter as the liggers filled his flagon with the landlord's strongest ale and waited for his closing number. Jemmy's favourite tale now. Who knows why I keep this beer? He'd stroke the boot black mane, a twinkle in his single eye, as all the boozers feigned in ignorance and willed them on to take them by the hand and lead them to St. Angelo, where Jem had seen the lamb. So tame it was, about yea big, it trotted by my feet, just like a dog, it filled my heart to see a thing so sweet. An hour or so he walked with me, and then that little lamb did block my path and for my eyes did turn into a man. At this point, Jem would pause and wait. He'd drink deep from his beer till someone said, Well, that's as maybe. Why have you got the beard? Ah, he'd say, because I not told you what the strange man said. He said, Now, Jem, you grow yourself a beard and wear it till you're dead. At which point they all laughed and cheered. Some greased his palm with gold. For Jem, like all great troubadours, believed the tales told. And this belief would pass to them, so as they walked askew back to their little homes, they willed the stories to be true. While Jem would pull the blanket round him, stoke his little hearth, and feel the snuff kick of performance drain clean from his heart. His tales were just a substitute, mere bum fluff to a beard of real adventure, like those when his fabled lamb appeared. He'd feel his little purse of coins and weigh it in his head. Not long, he'd think. Not long, Jem boy, and shuffle off to bed. And as his purse grew heavier, his meaty heart grew light. He'd boil the candy on his fire and plot right through the night. The wars of France were long since won, and Paris called to Jem to live beside his former foe. He'd trade and drink, and then he'd venture down to Italy, see Venice, Florence, Rome. Perhaps he'd find a fishing port and make himself at home. His drinking buddies saw him off. Good riddance, mate, they lied. What, Paris, Jem, you're mad, one said. In that case, he replied, in Paris, I'll jump off a bridge. He set off down the lane, allowed a po comic's pause, then turned, because then I'd be insane. With that, he left them scratching heads beneath the pale sun. That he was tapped, they all concurred, but no one got his pun. And so, like Kemp, he danced the roads, his duck drum heart keeping beat, until at last, with hands on hips, he stood on Hampstead Heath, with London spread before him like an old familiar mistress. He traced her curves and laughed aloud, recalling former mischiefs, then dived into her secret places, dark nooks he'd once known, when flush and demob happy, where his wild oats were sown. Then, when the quiet of the road was well and truly slaked, he set about this job in hand, the French consulate, to buy himself a passport and a ticket to Boulogne. He stood there in the panelled room and counted out his coins and barely breathed to see them go. Then, with his purse discharged, they stamped his passport, held it out and wished him bon voyage.
But as he left the concert with his precious souvenirs, a lump of grief sat in his guts. For Jem had worked ten years to grow that tiny purse of shillings. Hot nights on the cold, his vocal cords in ribbons shouting, good for a car for a cold. And now the sheer enormity of what he'd done weighed hard. As Jemmy wandered London's lanes past drunks and ballad bars, declaiming by the drinking shops, their voices tolled like bells. Old Dando's at his tricks again, that bouncing seedy swell. He had a day to kill in London, till his ship set sail. So Jemmy found a little pub and drowned his doubt in ale. And as he did, his sunken spirit soared. So too his showman's lust. So Jem resolved to puff the purse, to hit the streets and busk. So out into the fetid stench of Great Queen Street in Holborn, cap upon the muddy ground, he belted out an anthem, danced a jig and took his bow. Alas, they hurried by. Nice women turned their heads when faced with Jemmy's missing eye and fearsome beard. A hero shrugged. He took a sniff of snuff. He knew, like all performers know, that London crowds are tough. But he had had worse, and so emboldened by the drink he had necked, he launched into another number, which was also met with haughty glares and hurried steps. More snuff, another song, and yet more snobs. What's wrong with ya? Alas, it wasn't long before a brace of peelers clopped his beard and sewn up socket. Empowered by the vagrant's act, they emptied out his pocket, found the fresh stamp passport. Now what's this? The big one leered. You'll have to see the magistrate. And he'll make you shave that beard. No man alive will sh ever shave my beard. Our hero cried. Well, if that's your attitude, they laughed. You'll spend some months inside. And so to court and heavy irons chafing at his wrists. He stood there in the stifled air and balled his meaty fists. The long-nosed judge peered down at him and offered up a chance. You shave that beard. You smarten up and you may go to France. The courtroom settled to a hush. The scratching of a pen. A copper's adenoidal wheeze, but all eyes were on Jem, who met the judge's owlish gaze, heart bursting at its seams, and weighed his past against his future. All his foreign dreams now pit against his treasured tales. Sweat beaded down his brow. He closed his eyes. He swallowed hard. He gave a little bow. Good choice, the reedy judge replied, his thin eyes on the clock. Upon which Jimmy howled and beat his chains against the dock. No man alive will shave my beard. He swung his manacles and dragged the flanking officers into a barroom brawl. He gnashed his teeth with menace and he fought with all his zeal until they beat him down and dragged him off to cold bath fields where, broken, caked in blood and spent, they did just as he feared and pinned him to the icy floor to shave that mighty beard and threw him in a cell to stew until the autumn came, when Jem was turned out on the streets with nothing but his name. No shillings left, no passport neither, nowhere left to go. He schlepped back up to Birmingham, but he felt his stubble grow. So Jemmy walked the bull ring till his beard was white and old. Calm position, calm position. Good for a cough or a cold. Them's me lots. Super. That's amazing, Luke. Thank you, mate. That was really, really good. I love that. Thanks for having me. Nice to see you. I don't, I don't know where you're getting the energy from. I really don't. Are you doing the snuff every day? <laughs> snuff every day. Yeah, I, I mean, I mean, I am, yeah. I am, I'm enjoying a bit of snuff as a little nighttime treat. I've, I quit smoking. I saw you earlier, Selena. I saw you, Selena, having your cigarette, and it made me feel sick with jealousy. But um, I basically started smoking in earnest as a little treat to myself when lockdown started. And then I got to the point where I was smoking about twenty roll ups a day, so I thought I'd best stop. So I've been quite unpleasant company these last few days as a result. But that's oh, just well. the way. At least you're on your own. <laughs> Well, I mean, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm with me, I'm with my kids. I've got my kids. Oh, sorry, oh, I didn't realise. I thought you meant the bad company. I thought you meant you were just bad company for yourself. Oh, sorry. <laughs> myself and bad company for my kids. Yeah, yeah, my poor kids. Well, I mean, no, I mean, you've got to hold it together for the kids, but. Yeah. <laughs> that's uh, yeah, that's a admirable choice to stop smoking <laughs> during this most stressful time of everyone's lives. <laughs> Fair play. Thank you, Luke. Much appreciated. Um, can I just say, Jack, right, 
where you are now, I'm trying to unmute you. Like where you are now, it's dark, right? But until about half an hour ago, it was broad daylight where you are, and I'm looking out my window, and it was pitch black. Like what the fuck? <laughs> are you in Leeds? This is Leeds. This is this is what happens. I've I've done this before where I've been in a meeting and I start and it's light and it all feels fine. And then about 15 minutes into it, I'm like, I look like a weirdo. Uh, uh. This is yeah. why I moved near the lights to be a yeah, bit less weird. I looked outside and it was dark and you were still light. That's a good advert for Leeds, I say. Yeah, maybe the moon. Maybe the moon. I, the moon's out. It's just Leeds. It's closer <laughs> it's to the sun. bright, mate. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, when, when are you moving back? When are you getting back here? Uh, next year, probably. I reckon. We'll see. Right. Uh, Tori is saying, brush that under the carpet you, quite quickly then. <laughs> are you outside? I don't know. Um, okay, I'm going to switch now to our final act. Selena Godden, how are you doing, Selena? You all right? Hello, I'm okay. How is everyone? You've been sat there patiently since eight o'clock. Oh, I've drink, loved, a I've loved oh. every single poem. It's so good to see all your faces. I miss everyone so much. It's oh, weird, isn't it? God. Yeah. I really love you. Well, thank you that you've thank you for doing your first ever online gig with us. I'm really okay. really buzzing about that. I've been really shy about doing this. Um, yeah. I'm not sure how this works. I've been really shy about doing this. Like like being in my house and doing a gig feels like a really odd thing to do. It is. Yeah. But I have been watching Luke doing his, and it's just amazing. And um, congratulations on such energy and for doing that. But yeah, no, I've I kind of, I've been very much like on a seesaw. So I've had days where I've been like, yeah, like just getting loads of shit done. And then I've had days where I can't fucking think. So it's just kind of, yeah, it's just every, yeah, just trying to keep busy and um, and trying to be a little bit productive. Yeah. So like the other morning I got up and I paper gripped a piece of paper to my hair like that. <laughs> And decided that I looked a bit like a kind of goody proctor, kind of um, Puritan person. And this was the poem that I wrote. But this poem's called, I saw goody proctor jogging without a face mask. So this poem started as a tweet and then it turned into a poem. And then the next thing you know, I'm walking around the house with a piece of A4 paper gripped to my head. So um, it goes like this. I saw Goody Proctor jogging without a face mask. I saw Goody Proctor and John Proctor walking side by side, holding hands to a breast with devil's breath. I saw Goody Proctor clapping for the NHS. She were too very close to her neighbour and both without bra or manners. I saw Goody Proctor under the full moon this very week. She was a gazing up with unwashed hands and naked, unshaved legs, and she had virus eyes. I saw Goody Proctor and John Proctor, and they were not near home, and they were under the open sky sun, and they had two whole toilet rolls each, and they walked together in merriment. I saw Abigail Williams and Elizabeth Proctor. They were together and close as devil's breath, with eggy mouths and unwashed knotted hair, no lipstick and no hand sanitizer. I saw Goody Proctor doing yoga with a black cat. She did warrior pose. Twas the dance of a devil's whore. <laughs> I saw Goody Proctor have a double Baileys with our breakfast coffee, you know, to take the edge off. <laughs> I saw Goody Proctor cough once, cough twice, and then thrice cough, and her phlegm was the black of Satan's cock, and her droplets made sick all. I saw Goody Nurse be told she be unwelcome and immigrant and of foreign blood. Then I saw Goody Nurse unpaid proper and made to risk her own life 
the knelt, but a hand clapping. Thank you. Not that, uh, you know, I mean, I've been going out um, every Thursday night and joining in with the hand clapping. I've broken three wooden spoons, no, two wooden spoons, and I've now moved up to using a ladle and a pot and screaming, give them PPE, um, which kind of feels um, like something to do um, on a Thursday night. And I've met my neighbors and I've given out books. It's a thing, not my books, just books. That would be weird, imagine walking up and down my street going, yeah. Have my book, yeah, yeah. I wrote this. Have it, have it. Good reading. Oh, that would be terrible. I didn't do that. <laughs> I didn't do that. Okay. Um. So that poem, um, the Goody Proctor one, is on the new EP that I'm releasing with Matt with Nymphs and Thugs. Fifty percent of sales go to NHS and towards PPE, um, and towards uh, a mental health. Uh, oh God, that's us. To helping it, it, the thing. The mess. This poem is called Pink Moon. It's a palindrome. I wrote a palindrome. I know. I never write form poems. So this is a palindrome and it's called Pink Moon. And it goes exactly like this. Um, and, and, and I'm very angry writing this poem, but I don't swear in it or anything, which I always think is very clever of me when I, when I contain that rage. It was written the day of the full moon um, when Boris Johnson was in hospital um, and it goes like this, it's called Pink Moon. The night is still as April's pink moon rises in his hot and fevered bed. The powerful and wealthy man, how he believes he sees an angel walking in the soft shoes of a nurse. <clears throat> she holds his life in her tired hands. She works so hard and for so little. She will fill his cup with water. Below the hospital window, moonlight washes the city and the Thames shimmers in the shadow of Westminster Bridge. A homeless teenager shivers with no home to be safe in. And it is in that human moment, as he watches her pour water, He's no longer blind to angels. He'll know the damp fear of sickness as the moon shines bold. How the angel is the nurse. How the hospital is a church. How everything is nothing. And money is nowhere. And your love is here. And heart is now. And life is a debt. You pay back in kind. And your soul is like a wide, hungry mouth screaming, feed me the truth. Now do you see why? The first lesson a disaster teaches us is how fragile this is. How everything is connected. How we are all one. Blood and air, water and bone. With the same supermoon. Supermoon. With the same water and bone blood and air, how we are all one, how everything is connected, how fragile this is. And disaster teaches us the first lesson. Now do you see why? Screaming feed me the truth is like a wide hungry mouth. You pay in kind and your soul and heart is now and life is a debt. Money is nowhere and your love is here. How everything is nothing and the hospital is a church. How the angel is a nurse as the moon shines bold. He'll know the damp fear of sickness. He'll no longer be blind to angels as he watches her pour water. And it is in that human moment with no home to be safe in. A homeless teenager shivers in the shadow of Westminster Bridge. And the Thames shimmers. Moonlight washes the city below the hospital window. She will fill his cup with water. She works so hard and for so little. She holds his life in her tired hands, walking in the soft shoes of an angel how he believes he sees an angel, the powerful and wealthy man in his hot and fevered bed, in as April's pink moon rises, 
the night is still. Thank you. Um, this is a short poem. This one's also on the um, lockdown EP. Every disaster movie starts with the government ignoring a scientist. <laughs> yeah. Every disaster movie starts with the government ignoring a scientist. Yeah. Every disaster movie <laughs> starts with the government ignoring a scientist. Every disaster movie begins with the government ignoring the signs, the barking dog, the flight of birds, the stomach contents of a dead whale, the rising temperature, the color of rainwater, a woman speaking, any woman speaking, the enlightened being, the poet, the artist, the prophecy, the writing on the wall, the lyrics of songs, the children's nightmares, the poor, the sick, the elderly, every disaster film has everyone ignoring, the homeless person crying for change. Okay, this next one. Um, okay, so this is going to be strange. I'm going to do I Want to Be Your Wife. We'll see how this goes without me being able to see uh, or hear feedback. I'm going to do it really straight. Because um, actually, I need you to know this. When I wrote this, um, it wasn't um, funny. I, I thought I was writing a horror poem. Um, but then when I did it, people like Joel Taylor and Kevin... Kevin Kill all laughed bloody pants off and I was like this isn't supposed to be anyway okay at the end of the day I want to be your wife I want to wear a cream satin nighty sit at my vanity table rubbing my hands vigorously with hand cream I will moisturize my hands and my forearms and elbows, and listen as you tell me a thing, which is very important. You put down the New York Times and take off your glasses to tell me this thing, and I will look into the mirror at my reflection and over at you. You lay on the bed in your vest and shorts and socks, whilst contemplating this very important thing. I will pull a battle brush through my hair, it will be very lovely hair and very easy to brush and it will be brushed and brushed and brushed and it's then I will pause, look at you in the mirror and say, you know what you've got to do, you've got to kill your boss. Number two, at the end of the day I want to be your wife. At the end of the day, I want to be your wife at the end of the day. I want to be your wife at the end of the day. In the morning, I want to be your wife. I will pour fresh orange juice into sparkling glasses from a glass jug placed in the center of the lay breakfast table, laden with bowls of berries and stacks of pancakes. I rinse a cup in the kitchen sink glance out of the window with the neighbor's ginger cat. I mumble, damn mangy cat crapping everywhere, damn mangy cat crapping everywhere. And then I'll turn to you and ask about our lake house. It's been a while, I say. <laughs> and you nod and tell me you will think about it. You won't have time for breakfast. But you pour yourself a coffee from the pot. It is good coffee, expensive coffee. You surf it quick as you leave. You kiss my cheek super quick because you need to go because you're a very, very busy man. You might take a bite of toast. I hear it crunch. Your jaw clicks. The muted television, the news. A body has washed up on the beach. Number three. At the end of the day, I want to be your wife at the end of the day. <laughs> at the end of the day. At the end of the day. 
at the end of the day, I want to be your wife, your wife at the end of the day. At the end of the day, I want to be your wife at the end of the day. I want to be your wife at home doing laundry. When we talk on the phone, I will always talk to you whilst holding a full laundry basket on my hip. Okay. The phone sits in the crook of my neck. I do not put the laundry basket down <laughs> whilst talking to you. I will be a very good wife, but very good at laundry basket phone calls. This is a thing I will be very good at. I will talk of ordinary things. A man came to fix a thing. Don't forget the dinner thing. The neighbor's cat is missing. I tell you, I saw the neighbor staple leaflets to lampposts. We laugh a little. <laughs> Mangy crappy cat. <laughs> Shitty little cat. <laughs> Number four, this is the last bit. At the end of the day, I want to be your wife. At the end of the day, I want to be your wife. At the end of the day. At the end, at the end of the at the end of the day. When at the end of the day. At the end of the day, I want to be your wife, your wife, your wife, your wife. I want to be your wife at the end of the day. I want to be your wife. I'm outside the local supermarket. I want to be your wife. I carry groceries and I wait to cross the busy road. I want to be your wife. Something's off. A grapefruit rolls to the curb. A dog runs into the traffic. Your boss's body has been found identified, washed up on the beach. But the wisteria is really beautiful this year. <laughs> Everything's fine. I want to be your wife. The neighbor's cat has been found hanging in our apple tree. Everything's fine. <laughs> it's all fine. I want to be your wife. I mean, at the end of the day, I want to be your wife at the end of the day. I want to be your day at the end of the wife. Thank you. Okay, I think that's probably me done. Oh, Selena, that was incredible. That was amazing. I don't know how you can do that, even online, where you do the thing where you repeat it and you get people in the palm of your hands and everyone's laughing. Even online, you can do it. Oh, to be honest with you, I was just laughing at Kevin and Toria and Luke <laughs> and your faces. Um, yeah, oh, that's very strange doing that. Um, well, everyone's loving it on Facebook as well. And um, we also had somebody say that they were a mental health nurse for the NHS and really appreciated your shout out as well. So that's good. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Yeah, we've got to get behind, get behind the nurses and get behind the NHS. I know it's so difficult, but I mean, my, my grandmother, my, both my grandmothers were nurses. I just, I just, uh, I just trying to imagine what, how, what they would make of all this. Yeah, it's it's impossible to think in it really. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you mentioned the lockdown EP that's available to pre-order now, um, and there's also the Live Wire album and the Live at Byline EP. So we've got loads of stuff, haven't we? And also you've got Mrs. Death, Mrs. Death come out coming out in January, yeah. February. Yeah. There we go. Amazing. Yeah. Look, it's a real, real book now. It's a real, I real book. I haven't even done a gig with this yet, so. Like with the book, with how it, the finished, finished. So yeah. yes, I'm looking forward to doing that. But I mean, everything is so, nothing is certain and everything's so strange and everything's so strange now. Um, but yeah, the book is coming out in January um, and the title's Mrs. Death, Mrs. Death. Um, and and it, weirdly enough, it's a book about a positive, optimistic, look at why we should live our lives to the fullest and if ever we were going through something where we're being taught that how important the small things are and the big things are just suddenly have just disappeared and everything the small things are just beautiful and big to us now just these little moments of people being kind just mean everything yeah um i find it really um yeah so it's it's amazing things i'm learning every day and and the yeah. what the kindness and people just being bloody beautiful really there's a lot of beauty going on i know it's very scary and, and dark but god there's some fucking really kind people 
Just... Yeah, it's, it does seem like people are pulling together a bit. Even, even on Twitter, you still obviously you've got knobheads on Twitter, but it does seem that people are pulling together a lot more than, say, like at this time a year ago. Yeah. Yeah, and the community spirit and people just pulling together in their neighbourhoods and everything. Oh, it's, yeah. it's, it's amazing. It's amazing. Well, thank you. I'm so honoured that you've done your first online gig with us. Do you reckon you'll do it again? It's I don't. I, think I quite liked it. I really, I really quite liked it, and I really like seeing you all again. And I miss you all like hell. But yeah, I loved it. I loved it. <laughs> oh, thank you. You're a star. Um, well, thanks everyone who's been watching, and um, thank you to you. Can you all hear me? It says my internet connection's unstable. Oh, no, it's all right now. Um, yeah, no, thank you to everybody just for being on the label and for supporting the label. And everybody who's ever bought merch or followed us online, it means a lot. It was a, a silly idea that I had five years ago, but it's changed my life forever. And I'm very, very proud that you guys are all on the label. So, um, yeah. I'm hey, happy, bir happy birthday. Now. Matt, happy birthday. What a fantastic. Thank you so much for all of your support, all of the amazing parties, all the brilliant events, live wire events, all the stuff we've done at Byline, all the gigs, all the stuff, your amazing support. It's excellent, excellent service to poetry. Oh, Matt. thank you. I really appreciate that. That means a lot. I'll give thank him a cuddle for all of you. <laughs> thank you to all of you. I really appreciate it. You're all amazing people. Thank you. It's, uh, yes, yeah, one of the best things I've ever done, I think. And thanks to Jack for helping us out and chatting to us and telling us, putting us on the straight and narrow. <laughs> hey. raise a glass to you. I wouldn't raise a glass to you. I'm empty, finished. Babe. No, I'm 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 empty. I, I wasn't <laughs> going to drink. I wasn't going to drink, but then uh, oh, Selena was was it inspired me. <laughs> you can't do anything with Selena and not drink, even if it's yeah, digitally. Yeah. You've got to like, <laughs> um, Have you got any final words, Jack, just to wrap it all up? No, no, not all really. Just say, uh, yeah, um, it's exciting to think about where it, where it could go from here, really, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Cool. All right, guys. Well, thanks, everyone. I'm going to end the meeting in a sec. But yeah, just one more time. Thank you all. I love you. Thanks for giving up your time and for working with me. And yeah, amazing. Yeah, love much love, Matt. Love you, yeah. everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.